Welcome survivors. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to share with you today. Uh, before I get started, are any of my children here? I don't see them so good. I can be honest with y'all. <laughs> it's such a joy for me. I have my three daughters, Bonnie and I have three daughters, and we have my three daughters and three son-in-laws here attending the conference with us. And uh, tomorrow, we're going to rip up the golf course as Team Jacobs. So uh, y'all that were thinking about playing, you might as well just go watch the ball game. Um, this is a, a special session that I'm going to share with you because I often prepare for an opportunity to speak by asking myself if I knew that this was the last time I was ever going to be able to speak to this group and what I said to them needed to be the very best of what I know to be true in the Lord, what would I say? And I think that's helped me through the years to really see every opportunity that I have. It could be the last, who knows? Either the Lord may come back or I may go home, but it could be the last. And what I'm gonna share with you today is exactly what I would tell my very best friends, my family, and y'all, if I knew that I would never have the opportunity to speak to you again. It's the single thing that in all of my passionate pursuit of understanding God and God's ways has been the most helpful to me and by the testimony of others, the most helpful to them. So that's what we're going to talk about, two keys to your most important hour. And to get started in thinking about what we're going to talk about today, I'd like to ask you, how do you define success? Just in your own mind, reflect. How do you Define success. Does anybody here who does not want to be successful? No, it's, it's really built, built into us to want to be successful, but we need to know what success looks like. So how do you find, define success? Another question, how does God define it? As Christians, our definitions need to be the same, don't they? Our definition of success needs to be what God's definition of success is. We only get one turn around the track and we need to get it right. And if it is our desire to be successful in God's eyes, our definition and his definition needs to be the same. So. Let's talk just for a moment about how does God define success. And we'll look at his word to tell us about that. Let's get some insight. Let's start with Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Verses 8 and 9 are very familiar to almost every Christian. It tells us in verses 8 and 9 that our salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. So we can't boast about our salvation, right? And I would often speak and ask crowds, can you recite from memory Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? And most people can. Then I say, well, what does verse 10 say? And most people can't tell me that. And yet it may be one of the very most important, impactful verses in all of the New Testament. Now think about this, because Ephesians 2, 10 says, for, we're saved by grace through faith, for, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. How do we get created in Christ Jesus? Anybody tell me? By being born again. When we're born again, we're created in Christ Jesus. We are his work, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We're not saved by works, but we're saved to do good works. And it goes on to say, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When we tell a non-believer or a new Christian, God has a plan for your life, we are exactly right. God has a plan for every believer's life. And I'm a businessman and I talk primarily to businessmen, but for you moms that are here, you grandmas that are here, you, you ladies that are here that are not a part of C12 in terms of our business focus, this is every bit as true for you as it is for the business owner or the janitor in the business owner's company. It's true for all believers. We, all of us, 
are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he has prepared beforehand. Where is beforehand to God? Well, you know, it's got to be before he created the heavens and the earth. Because God being the omniscient, eternal, ever-present person, before he created time, there wasn't any time. Right? When he had the, spoke the word and the, and the universe came into existence, he already knew his plan for your life and my life. And his plan was that we be here, now, at this time, in this economy, in this place, doing what we're doing right now. It's part of his plan. And the works that he planned for us are important enough to him that he thought of us and he planned for us and he sent a savior to us to enable us to enter in to that plan. So what does success look like from God's perspective? Is simply to do what we're created to do. To do what he's created us to do and to do it well and to do it successfully. And ultimately, our success will be defined by how we run the race that is set before us. How many of you remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1? It says that we run a race that is set before us and we must run it with endurance. It says we've got to cast aside the sins and the entanglements which so easily ensnare us and run with endurance. The race is set before us fixing our eyes where? On him, on the author and finisher of faith, Jesus Christ. And so what will success look like for us believers, brothers and sisters? Success for us will be to finish that race spent, used up for God and fall into the arms of Jesus and hear him say, well done, well done, welcome home. I'm so happy you're here. You did such a great job of what I planned for you. Can you imagine? Is there anything that this world could offer us that could compare with that in any way? I've known business success for years. I've had all the toys that the world can offer. I've tried everything that the world said would make me happy and make me feel good. Everything before I met the Lord at age 35. Nothing gives me goosebumps like hearing that, thinking about that, that moment when I put off the mortal and I step into eternity and Jesus is there and he says, I hope, well done, Buck. And I'm sure that's true in your heart. But you know what? The world has another agenda for us, doesn't it? The devil knows full well he can't steal our salvation, but he can steal our destiny. He can divert us, deflect us, and discourage us into doing a whole lot of things that have no eternal significance at all, that are not a part of God's plan, that God couldn't care a fig about, but he thinks are really cool. And unless we're really careful, like a bass rising to a bait, we can go for it. Have any of you ever stumbled and gone for something the devil told you was important and you know found out later that wasn't important at all? Anybody else? I sure have. And one of the reasons that C12 is so important is because we come together and encourage one another to remember first things, keep first things first. The first thing is to finish the race and to be successful in God's terms and to guard one another and hold one another accountable. So how do we prepare for that? How can we keep focus on the real race that's set before us? We pray for it and we maintain it and we sustain it by gaining an intimacy with Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other teacher. There's no other, th there's no other way. It's intimacy with Christ that's the answer. We are given the opportunity when we're born again. And then we build a day at a time, a moment at a time, a brick at a time on the foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And it goes on to talk about how we can build on the foundation of our new life with wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, or precious gems. But the, all those works are going to be tested by fire. And any works of our lives that burn up are going to cause us to suffer loss. Those that pass through the test of fire will bring us a reward, and that's got nothing to do with salvation. 
It has only to do with success as Jesus defines success. Who will give us the rewards that we'll earn as we process through life into heaven? Jesus will. Who will be the judge? Jesus will. Who designed the rewards? Jesus did. Do you want all the rewards that Jesus has set aside for you? Some people are, are wrongly and falsely so humbly, so I, I'm not a, I'm, I don't care about rewards. I, I understand that feeling. I don't care about the rewards either. But he does because he's the one that created them and has prepared them and set them aside for us. So as long as they're important to him, they're important to me. How do we go about developing this intimacy with Jesus? Our source is abiding in Christ. Let's look at the word. This is from the 15th chapter of John. If you've never really delved into deeply into the 15th chapter, the first, especially the first part of the 15th chapter of John, I, I just couldn't recommend it more. It talks about how God is the vine dresser and Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. You know, the vine dresser is the one that cares for the garden. The vine is the one that brings the sustenance to the branches. And the branch's job is to do what? Produce fruit. What's fruit from God's perspective? Fruit is lives turned towards him. Fruit in a life committed to Christ means that because of the way we live, what we do, what we say, and how we do it, others are influenced to turn to God. Some of them turn to God from being lost and they're saved. Some of them are saved, but they're struggling in their faith. They're encouraged to grow. Some of them never even thought of God until we come along and give them bread when they're hungry. But as we do those works, those works that have been prepared for us from the foundations of the earth, lives are turned towards God, right? And that's what those good works are. And that's, those are the things that will bring the rewards. And Jesus said this. He said, you're going to need to abide in me. What does it mean to abide? To abide means to stay in, to remain in, to live in, and to, and to follow. We've got to stay in Christ if we abide in him. Abide in him, me and I and you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless, can't bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can't do much. No, he didn't say that, did he? Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing that's not in his plan, driven by his spirit in obedience to his will will have any eternal value at all. Most all of the things that our culture and the world has told us are important are not important. We are so blessed by our presenter's presentation last night and his realization of the need to disdain the things of this world. And remember what he said, choked out the, the second fruit that had good root but never, or seed that had good root but never produced any fruit? The cares and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Well, we got a war against that. Does that mean that God doesn't want us to ever have anything that's nice? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that we're to receive what he has for us to use in his way, in his kingdom to produce fruit. That's all. See, I believe God calls some of his children to live in extreme wealth. Very few, because very few can handle it. In my experience, I've seen many more good men and women ruined by wealth than I ever have by poverty. In my own life experience, being poor was much easier than having access to abundance. But I believe that God wants Christians living in Malibu and in Scarsdale and in every uptown, downtown place that you can imagine. He wants his lights planted here and there, but the reason for going there will be different for those who go to those very expensive places. They'll go because God tells them to go. And they probably won't want to. They'll probably say, oh, God, I don't want to go there. That's dangerous. God says, don't worry. I'll be with you. Go. And he calls some believers to live in abject poverty and everywhere in between. The definition of who we are 
is defined by what God tells us we're ambassadors for Christ and where we are depends on whether or not we're in obedience to him or not. It's pretty simple, really. And we need to see as we were exhorted last night that we are stewards of everything. 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 And building intimacy with Christ is the key. And this chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, I think really tells us that. So let me tell you my story, and I'll get you where we're going to go. And I won't keep you long today because I, I know it's really been a long day and we've still got some more tonight. I didn't get saved until I was 35 years old. That was <clears throat> 40 years ago. And I'd lived a totally hedonistic life prior to that, came from an agnostic home, had no church background, got saved when I was 35. I was like a sponge. To be forgiven of the sin that I'd accumulated in 35 years of living for Hugh Hefner, to be relieved of that burden was the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, and nothing greater will ever happen to me. And I wanted to learn all I could about, now how do I live? How do I live as a Christian? I know how to live as a heathen. How do I learn to live as a Christian? And I began to study and I began to read testimonies of others that had gone before me that had lived a, a heroic Christian life. I, I, I didn't want to be an average Christian. I still don't. Anybody here striving to be average? You know, average is the worst of the best and the best of the worst, and just about anybody can get there. No, I wanted to be a great Christian. I, wanted, I, I felt so overwhelmed with gratitude that I just wanted to do anything that God wanted me to do. In fact, I can remember praying, and when I prayed the prayer of repentance and accepting Christ, one of the things that I said intuitively, I said, Jesus, if this is true and you'll forgive my sin, and you want my life, you can have it, and I'll do whatever you want for the rest of it. And so I've been hard at it since then. That's my goal. That's my desire, to do whatever he wants. And I started reading all these stories of great Christians and uh, trying to get some, some hooks on what they did to be as, as successful in the race that was set before them as they were. And I read about people like Hudson Taylor, started the Inland China, China Missions, and I read about George Mueller, and I, I read about Mother Teresa, and I read about Martin Luther. You name it, I, I just read it. I'm a reader, I'm a studier. And something kept pricking at me. Every one of these great heroes of our faith when they were asked what was it that was the foundation for their ability to follow the Lord in the way that they had, every one of them said it was foundationalized by spending the first hour of their day with God, in His Word, in prayer, in a meditation on the Word, and in contemplation of His will, asking for His power to manifest in their lives through that day. And I kept reading it over and over and over again. There was a problem. I'm not a morning person. Anybody else here not a morning person? Yep, I wasn't a morning person. I could stay up all night, sleep in the morning, no problem. So I kept trying to do it different ways. I said, well, I won't do it in the morning. I'll, I'll do it last thing in, in the day, or I'll do it on my way to work, or I'll spend time with God. And I made a commitment early on to read God's Word for at least five minutes a day, and I kept that commitment one way or another. And I grew. And but I had this nagging feeling that there's got to be more than this. There's got to be a better way than what I'm experiencing. And these great Christian heroes all said, every one of them, Martin Luther said, I get up and spend the first hour of my day with God unless I have a very busy day. Then I spend two hours. <laughs> so along my journey, I began to, I, I began to enter in a new phase of my, of my journey. We sold our chemical business and. Illinois and I moved to Florida and I got involved with an organization called FCCI or Fellowship of Companies for Christ and I began to function as an area coordinator for them and just as I was getting into that mode one afternoon I felt God speak to me and God said this and I didn't hear a weird voice some creepy thing happened coming out of the woods or something it was in my heart and in my spirit how many of you have heard God speak to you in ways that you knew God was speaking to you it might have been through his word it might have been through somebody else it might have just been spontaneous but you you know that God has told you something well God spoke to me this time and he said Buck if you want to be effective in the lives of others I want the first hour of your day. Of course, I thought, that can't be God. He knows I'm a night person. 
But it was one of those things that just persisted, and I know many of you can identify with that. I knew God had spoken to me, and I knew as I entered into this new phase of life, this new realm of responsibility, that I had a choice. I could obey, or I could disobey. I could do what God was telling me to do, or I could continue to do what I had been doing. Well, I made the choice to obey God. But in my arrogance, I said, well, I'm not too sure that was you, God. Uh, I'll give it 90 days. Isn't that great of me? I'm going to test God and see if in 90 days he can prove it to me that it's worth it for me to spend the first hour of my day with him. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But that's where I was. That's where I was in my growth process at that point. And I said, I will start tomorrow. Well, I didn't realize that the next day, the next morning, I was going to be in a condominium on Longboat Key in Sarasota, Florida with my wife and two of our daughters, uh, spending the night there and getting ready to go lead a strategic planning retreat with one of our members the next day. So I was getting ready to go to bed and I thought, ooh, how am I going to do this? This is all one room. We're sleeping. I don't want to wake them all up so I can get up an hour earlier. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll set the alarm and I'll just go in the bathroom by myself. I know I can be quiet in there. So I can remember setting the alarm for 6. I had to get up at 7 to get cleaned up, to be at breakfast at 7.30, to meet with the executives and get started in our day at the executive strategic planning retreat. And as I looked at the clock and set the alarm at uh, 6 o'clock, I thought, Lord, it would be great if I could wake up before that alarm goes off so I don't have to wake up Bonnie and the girls. And I went to sleep. Next thing I remember, I opened my eyes, looked at the clock, digital clock. Guess what time it was? 5.59. Whoo, Lord, serious about this. I, get, I reached over and turned it out, and I went, in, I went into the bathroom. I took my Bible. I had no idea what to do in a quiet time except pray, read God's Word, and meditate on the Scriptures, you know. Just be there. And my, my commitment to God is, look, I'll show up. You've got to show me what to do. So I went in the bathroom and I sat down. I took a notebook and uh, my Bible and I sat down and I just started. And uh, I opened the Word and I got in and read a couple chapters of Scripture. And that was encouraging and invigorating. And I started to pray and I got the idea. I ought to write some of these things down that I'm having some pretty good thoughts. You know, not necessarily profound thoughts, but uplifting thoughts. So I, I took out the, it was just a common notebook, and I started making some notes. I started to formulate what was going on. And I did something that day that I do to till this day, which I think is so key to this whole process, and we'll get to it in just a minute. But without anybody ever telling me this was a good thing to do, I sat for a few moments, and I reflected on the blessings of God in my life in the previous 24 hours. And I was almost overcome with the realization of all the things that God had done in my life to provide for me, to sustain me, to protect me, to bless me in just the last 24 hours. Just take a minute or two right now, friends. How has God met you or blessed you or provided for you in just the last 24 hours, is there anything that you could say, thank you, Father. I didn't deserve that, but thank you. Can you think of anything? I know you can. And I wrote it down. And I wrote on the paper, blessing number one. Today, I've continued that practice for 9,650 odd days. And the first thing I do in the morning is remember the blessings of the previous 24 hours. And I'm going to share that process with you. These are the two steps to what I believe are the most powerful and important hour of your day. That by following this process that I'm sharing with you, your, your intimacy with God, your spiritual authority, your understanding and, and uh, appreciation for God and His blessing way in your life will increase to a degree that one day, if you do this and you're not doing it now, you'll do like a young gentleman did that came up to me at noon today 
who said to me, Buck, I heard you speak about this at the conference in Orlando, and I've been doing it for two years. And I want to tell you, my life has been changed for the better. You'll be able to do the same thing. So what are the two keys? The first step in building intimacy, the first step to, to consistency in the daily quiet time is to make it non-negotiable. You know, for all those years, for 15 years, I started and stopped. I tried to have a daily quiet time, but it was totally inconsistent. I'd do four days and then something would happen and I'd get knocked off track and I wouldn't pick it back up again for a week and then I'd feel guilty and pretty soon I'd just set it all aside. Now, this is really a very important key, friends. If you're not satisfied with your discipline of having a daily quiet time, now, this will alone unlock the process for you. We all regulate our lives based on the time we have to be somewhere in the morning, right? We know what time we have to get up, especially you business guys. You know if you have to be at the office by 8 o'clock. You know what has to be done before you leave the home. You know how long it's going to take you to work. So you regulate your life based on that criteria. Am I right? We do that. We live our lives that way. Even when we're staying at home with the kids, we know they're going to get up at a certain time, so we know we've got to be ready to go at that time. All you need to do forever to have a successful daily quiet time and to grow in intimacy with God is give Him the first hour. It's His. And set your alarm one hour earlier and make that non-negotiable. Don't let anything take God's hour away from Him. You know, if you have to get up at 6 o'clock to be at work at time on, in the morning, if your habit is 6, start getting up at 5. You know, it's a th <laughs> the devil is so clever. He tells you this lie, and this is an absolute lie from the pit. He tells you if you get up at 5 instead of 6, you're going to be more tired at the end of the day. And that's a lie. You're going to be tired at the end of the day if you sleep till 7. And so will I. How tired we are at the end of the day got nothing to do really with what time we get up. It's a lie. Make that hour, the first hour, belong to God and make it non-negotiable. Nothing that matters. I, I was challenged early on in, in my experience with this process. We went on vacation. We were at Disneyland. Again, we're all in one bedroom. Well, maybe we'll skip quiet time because I don't want... No, no, we don't do that. The first hour is God's. I got up, there was nobody else up in the hotel at 7 o'clock in the morning. Went down, found a nice quiet place by the pool, had my quiet time. Went back and got the family, went to breakfast. There is never a reason why we can't spend the first hour with God if it's His. And you business guys, don't tell me you can't do this. If your best customer said, I want to see you one hour earlier on any given day, you would just certainly be there. If you're not doing this because it's not important enough for you to make the sacrifice to do it, you might as well face that up. Might as well face up to the fact that you may get to the end of the race and hear Jesus say, well, good try, but you missed a whole bunch because I had all these things that I wanted to tell you about in the morning, but you never showed up. I was there. I was waiting. What happened? Eh, well, I slept in. I needed that hour of sleep, Lord. You know, I was up watching Fox News the night before, and not all stirred up about that Obama. No, uh -uh. let's be open and honest with each other. It's your choice, and you can do it, and you would do it, and you will do it if it's important enough to you. The second key, journal. Alan told us last night, put ink to it. There's something about writing it down that is imprinting in our mind. When we write things down, we will tend to remember them. In C12, we write down our to-do list because it helps us to remember and to be efficient in what we've, we've said we'll do. Start a journal. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm going to be transparent with you right now. This is what my journal looks like. This is a, spe this is a special journal. It's simply a three-ring binder. 
I like that because I can add pages or take pages out. It doesn't have to be something fancy, not a leather bound little thing, you know, that you've got to write ten. No, I want to write so that I want to keep it. In my basement at home today, I've got 19 of these. And this is what it looks like. Simple, written in my hand, just between me and God. I urge you to start counting your blessings. Start each day. See down at the bottom where it says blessing 7,531. Thank you, Father, for the date and shopping with Bonnie, especially the date part. Not so much the shopping. <laughs> Golf practice, the new clothes, talk with Don, testing the, the new mic, and for Bonnie, and for your love. Now, that isn't very, that's just stuff, isn't it? But isn't it, aren't those, and do I have a right to expect any of those things? Do you? No. We don't have a right to anything. Well, we do. We have a right to die and go to hell. We're born with that. But that's all we can demand of God. And you know what? Another thing that I do that's a key. Whoops. At the, at the end of every week, on Saturday morning, when I normally have more time, I review my whole week. I especially go back and look at those blessings of the week and I review my journal for the week. You know why? Because I've found that it is so very easy for us to forget God's blessings in our lives. And so very important that we develop what I call and I've heard called an attitude of gratitude. If we don't want to take God's love for granted, if we don't want to start to take our salvation, our faith for granted, it's very healthy for us to develop that attitude of gratitude. At the end of every year, I go back and review the whole journal. I want to have a grateful heart. God saved me from a real mess. And I never want to stop thanking him or praising him or remembering all the things that he's done, that he's given, that he's taught. I write, as you see, I commit to read at least two chapters of the Bible every day. And I write down what I write. That day I wrote, I read the chapter 18 of Luke and chapter 12 from Romans. Sometimes he takes me in and I might read four chapters, but never less than two. And my practice is I always read one chapter from the Gospels. Why is that? I like the red letters. I want to know what Jesus said. I want to know it. I want it to become a part of me. I want to abide in him. I want his word to abide in me. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you will be my disciples. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Didn't he say all that to us? I never want to be under, away from the sound of the voice of Jesus that's recorded for us by his spirit and given it to us in his word. So I always read one in, uh, in, in the Gospels and another one from somewhere else. And God has changed it and varied it over the last 20 odd years. And I don't feel legalistic about it, but this is just what God's put on my heart to do, that, to share with you. Record your thoughts. My method of doing that is writing a letter to God. Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for your grace in training me and loving me. Loving me through it. I'm sorry to be so stubborn, Lord. I don't want to be. I'm not trying to set myself as any example or anything that, that I've write, written or you should try to do it that way. You write your heart to God openly, transparently, and vulnerably. In my journal, you'll find times of confession. You'll, you'll find me pouring my heart out. God, I've screwed up so bad, and I'm so sorry. I've offended someone, or I've done this, or I've done that. Lord, forgive me. And there are other times when I'm just so full of praise, I just can't thank him enough. Then I write it all down. I write him a letter. Sometimes it's one page. Sometimes it's two page. Sometimes it's a half a page. 
You know what? God doesn't care. He just wants to hear. And I advocate, get started with this. Write that letter to God every day. Pour out your hearts to him. Record your thoughts. Tell him how you feel. Anything that you want to say or remember. So that's the second step. That's the format. I do some other things that you might find encouraging. This is my personal statement of purpose. My personal mission statement. If you don't have one, I recommend you write one. What's your race look like? What's the end of the race look like? My personal mission statement is before me every day when I open my journal, it says, my purpose is to be used up for God as I completely fulfill his plan for my life and to honor God through obedience and allowing to live his life through me as husband, father, grandfather, and minister. And then I've got a bunch of core values that go along with that. I urge you to think about it, write your own mission statement, your own statement of purpose. And I like to use these, I call them trappers. This is filled with personal things that mean something special to me. This uh, particular card is from my daughter, Leah. I don't think anybody's ever said anything more meaningful to me than Leah said in this card. I never, it was never hard for me to believe in a loving father above because I already knew the gentle strength of your love. Happy birthday. Have you ever gotten something like that? And if you did, wouldn't you want to keep it around? Well, this is just a great way to do it. I got pictures of my kids in here. I even got pictures of a dog that I love. <laughs> but all those things are part of life, aren't they? They're the really important things of life. You know what? I don't have a simple copy of any sales agreement I ever wrote in here. I don't have my personal net worth statement in there, but I've got things that mean so much, much more to me. I encourage you to do that. And then I flip over my trapper. Here's my prayer list. There are many people in this room whose names are on that prayer list. I find that really helps to keep a prayer list. I don't pray through it every day. I'm not a prayer warrior, but as God prompts my heart, I'll go back to it. And I'm reminded of the things, the pain in other people's lives, the circumstances that I need to lift up to him. And I guess I keep the prayer list because I'm not a prayer warrior. And I need to write it down. I need to be reminded. So that's really what I do. And those are the two steps that I, I so strongly advocate will make you a more effective leader, a more effective Christian. Make it non-negotiable. You start to negotiate with the world, the flesh, or the devil, <laughs> you better be good. Make it non-negotiable. You know, live a 23-hour day. One hour belongs to God. And, and then use it to journal, to, to do the process, read his word, soak in his word, abide in him as he's told us he must, we must. And if you're not doing that now, I guarantee you it'll change your life. Down in Florida, I used to teach this as part of a seminar. And I used to offer to the people that came to the seminar this guarantee, if you're not doing this now and you will try to do it and faithfully do it for 90 days, make the same deal I did when I started. If you do it for 90 days and at the end of 90 days, you come to me and you say, Buck, I tried it, but it just wasn't worth it for me. It didn't work for me. Then I would pay for a weekend or two at any resort in the state of Florida for you and the spouse. And I'll do that for any of you. If you're not doing this, and you will try it, maintain it for 90 days, you can contact me and say, Buck, it didn't work. God didn't show up. Wasn't worth it. Sorry. I'll pay it for a weekend for you and your spouse at any resort, any place in this country of your choice. You just have to get there. I'm that sure that it works. You know what? I've never had to pay off because you know what? It's not me. It's not the system. It's God. God is worthy. He's worthy of our first hour. I'm convinced 
that no Christian, this is a bold statement, no Christian will ever be all they can be or as successful as God wants them to be without the, the self-discipline of daily time with Jesus. You can tell me anything you want, I don't believe it. You can be successful, you can have a good Christian life, you can be average. But if your goal is to be average, I don't want to spend much time with you because I want to be around people who want to be outstanding for Christ. We're not going to change the world. We're not going to change this country with business as usual. That's what we've been doing. That's part of what's gotten us into the mess that we're in as a nation. We've allowed the culture, the world, and the flesh, and the devil to tell us that we have to privatize our faith, that we can't go public with our faith. And we've wimped out when it comes to the real issues. Brothers and sisters, we need to start to stand up and we won't ever do that without the intimacy that comes from Christ, without the courage that comes from knowing who we are in Him and where our source of power comes from and how powerful it is. And we need to get our marching orders personally every day. And believe me, God wants you to know His will. He wants you to come to the end of your race and receive every reward that He could possibly set aside for you. He wants you to live a life and leave a legacy that will go on touching and changing generations for generations and generations. That's God's desire. God is totally prepared to meet you tomorrow morning, first hour. He'll be there. Intimacy with Him is a choice, and it's our choice. He's already made the choice. God will be there. You can do it. The question is, will you? Are you like I was 15 years ago or 20 years ago, whenever it was? You struggled and tried, fired and fallen back, had it for a while, lost it, started, stumbled, felt guilty? Well, this is your chance to decide to be different, to decide to make it your priority to be God's priority. Will you? If you're not, will you? It's not me asking. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of speaking today. I thank you for these dear brothers and sisters that have persevered and come through a long day and been here. God, I pray your protection over them, that you'd keep them from any error that I've spoken, anything that I've said that is not driven by your spirit, that's not true, that's not edifying, not helpful. If I've implied or even inferred anything that's not your will, I pray you just have it fall off their back like water off a duck. But Lord, for those who are here that you've been speaking to about a greater plan for their life, about greater fruitfulness, about greater faithfulness, about more power, about more understanding, about a deeper walk, who really in their hearts do desire to abide in you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would bring that conviction. And with conviction, the repentance from dead works and the resolution to press on, to go forward, to get deeper. And I pray, Lord, that as they do, that you'll show them your plan that they may, by their faithfulness, be led by your Spirit to produce much fruit. Jesus said, By this shall my Father be glorified, that you should bear much fruit, 
and prove to be my disciples. Let it be so unto us, Lord. Let us go from this time of equipping and sharing this weekend to go into the fields that are ripe for harvest. Be those faithful ones, the exceptional ones who, not exceptional in who they are, but in exceptional of, in terms of understanding who you are in us. And let us bear much fruit to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.